Transvaal Asiatic Law Amendment Ordinance and the Asiatic Registration Act of 1907 forced Indians and Chinese males over the age of eight to register their presence in Transvaal and carry passes. So he would have to have a pass yes. at nine years old. Yes. And if people got it, then we in jail. Even if he's playing in the streets, mm. even if he's going to visit his friends, he must have his passport. Mm. And if he did it, and they snatch him, come here. to prison. And here, there was no juvenile section. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, the Native Taxation and Development Act forced black men over the age of 18 to pay standard tax, no matter how little they earned. This drove them off to their land, into the cities to look for work. Then this was difficult. You don't pay tax. The government has a right to take your land. That is why they came to the cities to protect their parents' land. Others, they were not lucky. They did not find jobs in the mines. Others, they find jobs, but money was not good. That is why others, because they were married, their wives, they came to Johannesburg wondering why our husbands, they're not coming back. Then they realized that they live in the hostels. Women were not allowed you know, to enter the hostels. If you are living in Eastern Cape, it can be eight to nine hours drive. And then you come to Johannesburg, you know, to visit your husband, you have to meet somewhere in a park. You're gonna sit there four hours, and then you have to go back home to Eastern Cape. Sometimes your husband wants to see the kids. Again, you have to come with the kids, they will be playing while you are talking, Three o'clock or two o'clock, they must catch a bus going back to Eastern Cape. So these laws, they've caused a lot of problems to our parents and also they've caused separation to our parents. I spoke about Immorality Act, made extramarital uh, between white and black a criminal offense. Then I asked, you know, one of the lady who was once kept here, because she was dating a white journalist. Who proposed to, because I wanted to understand it clearly, who was supposed to go to prison? Mm -hmm. And then she said, the white journalist was the one who proposed me. Then I said to her, and then why did you go to prison? Because he's the one who came to you. They said by that time it didn't matter, the problem was the color. They deported the boyfriend back to Germany while she spent three months in prison for holding hands with the white man. Mm. And she's still alive. And what I like about her, she still lives in Hilbro, where she was arrested. And today she does community work, fighting you know, for the rights of the people. Now we have a question, who is a criminal? A criminal now we can say someone who steals, someone who kills, but before, a criminal, it was a non-white found in white areas. You know some of the white tourists, especially from Germany, if I'm saying that, right. they don't like it. But it's our history, I have to tell it as it is. Right. If you are yeah. something, you must have a reason. He said he's nine. There were some kids who were arrested because they were found in something, you know, a uh, park town, and they were kept here because they wanted a reason. What are you doing in park town? Because you are black, you must have a reason, you know? And others, they were here because they were wearing t-shirts that were written, Aluta Continua, you'll go to prison for that. Robert Sobukwe, he was the leader and the founder of the PAC. Before, he was the member of the ANC. So while they gathered in Cliff Town and they were drafting the Freedom Charter, and Mandela was reading it, so he was not happy about the setting in clause. He said, wait a minute, Mr. Mandela, repeat. The clause said, everyone who lives, uh, so it says, South Africa belongs to everyone who lives in it. He said, no, no, no. 
I do not agree with that clause. South Africa belongs to black people because when young Van Riven came to South Africa, he drove away the Khoisan people and then he took everything. So now there was a debate between him and the ANC, but the ANC was saying, remember in this party, you don't have blacks only. We have Kanats, we have Indians, we have Chinese, all of us, we are fighting a struggle. He said, yes, I understand, but the land belongs to us. And then he realized that no one is listening, and then he pulled out from the ANC, and then he formed his own party. In 1960, he told South African that the only way that we can defeat this government, let us ban our passes. So they banned them. Unfortunately, in Soweto, they were arrested, but then in Sharpeville, six, nine people were shot and killed, and then he was transferred to Roman Island. Today, in South Africa, we are honoring those people. Um, 21st March. Today, that day, is called um, Human Rights Day, you know, just to honor those people who died. So, we may say these people that were here because they broke this law during that time, if you broke a law, you were a criminal. So, we are wondering why we have Gandhi's picture there. Gandhi, after he was told that the government is passing this 906 law, he was told to come to, uh, to South Africa, you know, to assist. And then he came to South Africa, and also he came with an idea of saying, leave your passport at home. We want to see if the government will be able to arrest each and every Indian or Chinese who was not carrying their passes. But he was arrested. He stayed here for two months. Later, he was released. He came back again up until 1913 during the Satya Graha. Then in 1914, he left. So these people, they were here because they were tired of these laws. The laws, they could tell them where they could live what work they could do, who they could love. You couldn't be a scientist, you couldn't be a doctor. You were told that you qualify to be a cleaner, uh, to be um, a gardener. So that is why politicians realize that the only way that we can win this is education. Let us educate ourselves. Absolutely. Yes. All right. That's what's up, some black empowerment. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Keep it strong. Keep, keep, keep on giving a real story. All the Germans and all the other devils, let them get upset. Yeah? They're upset because they can't rewrite history. You know what is happening sometimes? Sometimes I, I feel so scared as if the next time I say that, they will show me where the gate is. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we should never bend uh, telling history for anyone. If you're white and your your ancestors did terrible things, and yeah, you and you you, you, you enjoy the you enjoying the privilege, and this is why you enjoying the privilege. Exactly. You now deal with the drama and deal with the problems. What to mine? You know the last no, time I talked with another lady from London. Oh, that's nice. Them damn Brits, man. You know she she was saying. Um, I need to talk about you know whites who were also you know. Um, to that, you know, unfairly. Then I said, no, but look at this section. Here we are talking about the non-whites. If you want me to talk about the whites, you must go to the white male section. Mm -hmm. You know, she got angry, and then she called me a racist. <laughs> man, I wish I, said, I wish I was there, man. How'd I handle her? <laughs> then I said, it's okay, but it's my history. Mm -hmm. exactly. And that is why today um, our kids they are learning about our leaders. You know, in our times, we were taught about Hitler, mm -hmm. Mussolini. Yes. We didn't know anything about our own yes, South true. African history. Yes, you true. know, we said to the Department of Education, you are very slow. Push it, we need something. Mandela Gandhi, they are learning about Gandhi, the great fours and the great seven. Nelson Mandela, Winnie Mandela, um, the grade sevens, they are learning about uh, Fatima Mia's pictures that she drew in prison. So all the learners, when they are coming to this heritage site, it's covering their curriculum because when they learn about the court, we have the court. When they learn about democracy, constitutionalism, we covered everything. So this is our history. So if you don't like me, deal with it. Did Excellent work, sister. Do your job. Excellent, man. Pr proud of you. <laughs> Toilets. Steel. 
prisoners were carrying their smelling rotten food. They will be forced to face toilets. You see, there are no toilet seats, which means oh, when wow. John, there go. <laughs> Michael, wow. he's inside, he must squat. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And when he's squatting, he oh, expose inside. everything. Which means prisoners who were sitting here, they could see, they could hear, and they could smell. There was no privacy. Prisoners, when they are done eating, they will be counted, and then from there they will say, Here's my friend. Are you tired? Yeah. Come. <laughs> the stage is yours. Come and stand come here. Come. Son, come on, please. Are you scared? Are you shy? <laughs> then come. <laughs> so they will call one of the prisoners to come and stand here, and then they will say to him, Tauza, you are new in prison, you don't even know what is that. So you are asking, what is Tauza? They are going to use prison keys to hit your face, and then they are going to call someone to come and show you how to perform it. So Tawuza, it was a strip search. You take off your clothes, you jump up and down, you spin like an aeroplane, you click your teeth, spread your legs wide, you bend forward, then the prison officials will be checking your behind if you are not hiding anything in front of everyone. So to some of you know, the prisoners, it was very humiliating. And to them, they were saying, we don't like this Tauza thing because you are not respecting our culture. You see, I'm a six-year-old man, then I have to be naked in front of these kids. It's not part of our culture and you are stripping away our dignity. They never listened to me to that prisoner. Instead, there was a gentleman. You see that building there? That is Queen Victoria Hospital. Hell with Queen Victoria. That's What's up with all these Brits names, man? That's where white babies were born. So what? he was standing in that balcony because he wanted to see what is happening in this place. When you are outside, you only see the high walls, but you keep on hearing best words about this place. And then he saw this. Mm -hmm. He was confused. What's going on here? Are those kids? No, adults. No. Inmates were sitting on the ground. This old man, he's standing busy, jumping like a monkey. What's going on here? Anyway, he took some pictures. He went to the drum magazine's offices and then he showed his colleagues, you know, his managers that this is what I saw at number four and I'm not sure what's happening here. So they explained to him that this is how they conduct the strip search. He was very angry. He tried to publish these pictures, but then he was reminded that you can't. The magazine is banned already by the government. And when no one was noticing, he published the pictures, he ran away, he left the country. He disappeared for 20 years and the government was busy looking for the culprit because these pictures, they were saying to the whole world, this is how you know, uh, the government treat its prisoners in South Africa. And then he came back after 20 years. The next thing, he was involved in a car accident. He lost a lung and then he died. Mm. So now there were questions. Was it a planned accident or not? Mm. No one knows because... Well, these people make everything look like an accident though. Yeah, they were not conducted. Mm -hmm. And they knew that, you know, there was this task, um, group that was formed by the government, which was called the CCP, which stands for um, Civil Corporation Peru. Their task was to assassinate, you know, politicians, anyone who was trying to you know to disturb them. So they didn't know exactly what happened. No answers. The next thing, he was buried, pictures were burned. That was the end of him, just like that. We don't even know today what really happened. So we only saw these pictures for the first time in 2001. Mm. 
since they were banned in 1950s. So out of 2,000 prisoners who were kept here, instead of 979, they only had eight showers. Prisoners were only allowed to shower once a week. They were given one soap for 30 minutes, which means all of you, when we are standing here, we are waiting for the bell to ring. Once the bell rings, you'll be running like headless chickens. And then when you get down there, you must start fighting for the soap. You must fight for the showers. Otherwise, you won't get an opportunity to use the showers. So other inmates realize that in order for me to survive, I must stay away from the showers. Others, they ended up using toilets to wash their bodies, their uniforms, even their plates once they are done eating. Today, we don't even have those showers because when this prison was closed down, it was also vandalized. They were stolen. Okay, so this is where, all right. Yes, the showers were down here. Well, that's a lot of people for some small showers. 2,000 prisoners and these showers were becoming red because they were hurting each other here. Officials would be standing right there watching and doing nothing. So now we've just collected these bricks and stones as part of our heritage. See the glass towers there? That is to be the three-story building. That's where Mandela and the student of 1976 who survived the bullets were kept. And the block was demolished in 2001 to make a way for the court. So today we only have foster walls standing there as the reminder of the past. 150,000 bricks. They were also recycled they were also used to build the highest court in the land, just to show everyone that you can build the future with the bricks of the past. Testimony. 